<laughs> hey, good morning, and uh, welcome to a, another Sunday uh, Bible Bites. And uh, today we're going to continue to work our way through the Bible as we've done for uh, the past number of weeks. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to go forward with some of the lessons that are a little bit longer than others, so that so we don't get we don't get too long. But we're going to figure that out. Uh, we're still in the Old Testament. Uh, but before we begin, uh, let's open with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Uh, we're so grateful for uh, your abundant grace, uh, for all that you provide us each and every day. And we want to ask that you be with those who cannot be with us uh, here today, that you touch their hearts, that you uh, let them know that you are with them and that uh, there's a safe place for them to learn more about you here with us. We ask that you be with uh, so many of our our friends and family that are suffering from various illnesses. We ask you be with all those affected by the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we ask that you be with each of us in the coming weeks and, and everyone we know. And uh, we ask all of these son things in your son, Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, so as I just said, we're, we're still in the Old Testament. Uh, and we're moving into book number four, which is Leviticus. It was written by Moses in 1445 B.C. And it covers the period of 1445 B.C. Uh, to 70 A.D., a uh, pretty long time span. These laws applied until shortly after the death of Christ. In today's lesson, however, uh, we're going to prepare for the next key story in the Bible, uh, which will come to us maybe from the book of Numbers, maybe not. We may have to skip that book. Uh, the, there are only two key stories there, and both of them are, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, just a little bit dry. Uh, they're, they're more of a history, genealogy kind of story, so we may just move on to the next book. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's take a look at Leviticus. Uh, there really aren't any famous stories in Leviticus, uh, but there are many laws, many, many laws. Now, the name Leviticus is a boy's name. Uh, in Greek, uh, the origin uh, means belonging to the Levites. One of the most famous verses uh, comes from Leviticus 19.18 which says, do not seek revenge or bear grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbors as yourself. I am the Lord. Uh, we need to be reminded of that all the time, all the time. Uh, the current political climate uh, in America today has Republicans pitted against Democrats, Democrats pitted against Republicans, and we're all just kind of pitted against each other. And uh, if we read that verse every morning, uh, maybe we'd be able to drop some of our, of our grudges uh, and focus on loving our neighbor and praying for our neighbor instead of trying to figure out how we're going to get back at our neighbor for whatever it is they, they just said to us on Facebook. Uh, there's uh, rioters, uh, looters, arsonists, uh, all seeking revenge for shootings that there have been no completed investigations on. And, and we don't know the facts. Uh, we see social media weaponized. It's being weaponized uh, against people we don't even know uh, for things we don't even understand. Our world is becoming a dangerous place on all levels, and, and at levels we simply do not understand. What if we followed the law that we should love our neighbor? And know that the biblical word for neighbor means everyone. It's not just the guy living next door to you. It's everyone, everywhere, anyone you would encounter is going to be your neighbor. What if I said, as I said before, instead of seeking revenge against our neighbor, uh, we stopped for a moment and just prayed for our neighbor. Now, the book of Leviticus is mostly, and, and I'm going to come back to that word mostly, it is mostly, mostly uh, uh, a book of laws that was written uh, for the Hebrew people to keep them safe, keep them healthy, and keep them at peace. It also decreed that uh, priests 
shall be members of the tribe of Levi and descendants of Moses' brother Aaron. Now, Jesus changed a number of things at his time here on earth walking among us. Uh, that's one of them. Uh, we are all called to ministry, uh, but Jesus did give us one warning about the calling to ministry. And in James 3.1, uh, Jesus says to us, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And that's true. Uh, we see that today in so many ways. We've seen it in the past with uh, preachers and pastors being held to the higher standard to, as, as they should. And we've seen some fall from grace. Uh, we're seeing attacks on Jerry Falwell Jr. right now, and some of them may be warranted. But uh, newsflash, Jerry Falwell Jr. is not a pastor. He's not a reverend. He's not ordained. He's an attorney. All right. So people are trying to hold him to the standard of pastor uh, when he, he's no pastor at all. He's an attorney. Uh, he and his wife clearly, clearly have some issues they need to work out, but that's not for us, the general public, uh, to go on social media and the news and figure out for them. We need to leave that to them. All right, so also in Leviticus, Moses describes unclean animals and insects we shouldn't eat. God wanted to protect us from disease and unhealthy things. But here again, Jesus rewrote the law. Mark 7, 1 through 3, or 23 says this. Uh, Jesus tells us about old law and new law, that man can eat all animals. What's particularly outstanding, exciting, and amazing is that we learn that the human digestive system separates what is bad and passes uh, what is good into our body is nourishment. Science has proven the Old Testament right. And I, I was telling the guys here this morning that I was going to touch on something like this, but uh, I'm fascinated, as I am all the time, about things that are in the Bible. Uh, but to know that uh, in the book of Mark, in the Bible, 2,000 years ago, we were already learning how the digestive system and the human body work. How did they know that? They knew that because God told them that. It's the only way they could have known. It's incredible. Uh, the next important point in Leviticus is Moses teaching uh, on the Day of Atonement. It was once a yearly ceremony for the high priest uh, to enter the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice to God for the sins of the entire nation. Uh, but no one other than the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies uh, was inside the western end of the tabernacle. And it measured 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. And a cubit is about 18 inches or the length from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. Uh, so what that means is that the, the Holy of Holies was really about 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. A uh, pretty decent sized room, all right? Outside the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle were things such as a golden ark to hold the, the tablet of the covenants, uh, a table of showbread on which loaves were arranged, a golden menorah, a curtain veiling the Holy of Holies, a sacrificial altar, and several other items. And, and I highly encourage you to, to read this part of Leviticus because there's incredible detail on the setup and structure of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies was so sacred that before the high priest entered, they would tie a rope around him and then he would enter the Holy of Holies. And if he didn't come out and he didn't answer their calls and they were to assume he is dead, then they could pull his body out because they couldn't go in to retrieve him. So uh, they prepared for every 
possibility that could happen. Uh, several Christian religions uh, to this day still have Holy of Holies and enter it once a year. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, the Mormon Church, is one of those religions. They still have a Holy of Holies, and uh, they don't have a high priest, but the president of the, um, the Mormon Church uh, is considered their high priest, and he is the individual that enters their Holy of Holies every year. Uh, so, as we discussed earlier, we know that Jesus changed a number of laws but the question is, did he change them all? And the answer is a resounding no, he did not. Uh, the most famous law from Leviticus in our time uh, comes from chapter 32, verse 18. And it's a controversial verse, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And what that means, and just a, a quick, easy translation is, is uh, if a man lie with mankind, that means with another man. Uh, as if he lie with a woman, that means as if he would have uh, sexual relations with the woman, but he's having them with a, another man. Both of them have then committed an abomination. And they shall surely be put to death and their blood shall be upon them. Obviously, this verse does not sit well with a number of folks. Adam Hamilton, and we discussed him just a week or so ago, uh, he leads the single largest congregation in the United Methodist Church. Uh, he welds uh, more uh, influence and power over that denomination uh, than anyone in that, uh, that church. Uh, Hamilton, uh, discounts the entire book of Leviticus. Uh, and he, he insists that uh, because it was written for the Jews or for the Hebrew, that it only applies to them. It doesn't apply to the rest of us. That it wasn't written for anything we are doing here and now today. Uh, he says it was, it was a much different time. And we're in a, we are in a different time here today. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, that's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Now, we can't pick and choose uh, verses and entire books in the Bible uh, based on how they fit into our own personal narrative or social views on the world. Uh, many non-sayers uh, point to the fact that Jesus never mentions homosexuality, homosexuality in the New Testament. Well, a newsflash, uh, it's never mentioned anywhere in the Bible. The word homosexual doesn't exist in the Bible. Now, there's some uh, new modern translations of the Bible, including uh, the, uh, it's called the Gay Bible that has been written where they've changed a lot of words and they've added the word homosexual. But if you go back to the King James Version or you even go back to the scrolls, it's not there. It does not exist. But what I want to tell you is uh, in Romans one twenty seven. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes this, And likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of a woman, burned in their lust towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was met. And what that simply means is, here in the New Testament, uh, we're seeing Paul write about the fact that it's still a sin uh, for man to do with man uh, what he would normally do with a woman. Uh, being with a woman is natural. It's here in writing. All right? The natural use of a woman. All right? So for the naysayers that say that uh, the New Testament uh, has a new world view that no longer sees a man lying with man as being a sin, they're, they're clearly not reading this verse. This verse they're skipping over somehow. Uh, I don't want to call Adam Hamilton out, but I'm going to. Can he not read this? I, I don't get it. All right, Romans 127 is a blanket. 
a blanket condemnation of male homosexual activity, uh, and it endures to this present day. Now, I did a double check just in case I was confused, because sometimes I, I miss stuff and I skip over things and people correct me, but I double checked, and it turns out uh, Romans is in the New Testament. So, it still applies today as it applied yesterday. Everything in the Bible taken in context applies to us today. You can't get around it. Uh, this, this topic, however, I want to point out, uh, has uh, catastrophic effects on not just religious denominations, but individuals. Uh, there are denominations uh, such as the, the Lutherans, uh, the Episcopal Church that have already had splits over this issue. United Methodist Church was set to split this past May, uh, but they were delayed because of the COVID virus and won't meet until next year, which time that denomination is going to split over the issue of homosexuality. Uh, the United Methodist Church has been uh, completely swayed by Adam Hamilton, uh, who leads the charge in that denomination to accept same-sex marriage and the ordination of gay clergy. Now, the damage done to young gay men and women uh, isn't being done by conservative Christians. I, conservative Christians are not the ones who are out beating the drum to try and drive uh, these young people uh, to commit suicide. Uh, what's happening, however, is that uh, some progressives are leading the charge and they are, they are telling young people that conservative Christians hate them, that we hate them, everything about them. And that's simply not true. Can you imagine being a young person and you're being told that conservative Christians hate you because you're gay. And, and as that young person, you know your parents are conservative Christians. And that means that your parents must hate you. How can that uh, affect these young people? It has to be horrible. Now, according to the Trevor Project, and, and I'm providing a link in the description below, uh, gay youth contemplate suicide at three times the rate of their heterosexual friends and five times are more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual friends. All right, so I think as Christians, we can all agree that uh, these numbers uh, need to be brought down to zero. Uh, they shouldn't be any percentage above zero. And the first step in achieving that is for Christians, especially religious leaders, to stop telling these young people that conservatives hate them and to stop telling them they're going to hell. All right, if there's one thing I'm certain of, I'm certain of, is that none of us here on earth get to pick who goes to hell and who goes to heaven. None of us get to make that decision. God will make that decision on Judgment Day. Now, I've written about this topic uh, several times on our, our website, uh, which has led to this uh, uh, opportunity to, to counsel some young gay men on this issue and, uh, and I tell you the the power of God is so evident in this uh, because I never intended uh, to, to have a, a ministry of counseling young gay men never thought about it never planned for it never crossed my mind God however had a different plan and put several young men in my path who've, who've reached out to question me on my own uh, teachings uh, from the Bible on this issue. Uh, and I've been challenged. They have some, some really good questions. And some of the questions, however, are founded in what uh, progressives are telling them uh, that conservative Christians think of them. Um, and, and, and kind of a, a twisted, uh, uh, I, I don't know, thought or process or theology on what the Bible actually says. All right. So now the book of Leviticus uh, isn't necessarily a fun book to read. 
uh, and many folks, in fact, uh, and, and I've even known pastors who won't even preach on this book. Don't want to talk about it because there's not a lot of good news here. Um, but it is an important book for us to read and to understand because not only does it talk about so many laws, it explains so many laws. All right, so while Jesus no doubt rewrote some of the Old Testament, uh, he did not rewrite all of them. And they still apply to us today. Uh, not just the Hebrew, uh, but very much to all of us. Uh, one of the young men that I've, I've counseled uh, uh, suggested that since Jesus uh, didn't mention homosexuality in the New Testament, that Jesus must be good with it. Well, that's false reasoning. Uh, Jesus didn't mention many laws in the New Testament. And, and because he just mentioned some, doesn't mean that uh, by his omission of others that they don't apply anymore. Uh, that's, that's just false reasoning as well. Uh, but I do want to say that Jesus uh, didn't mention many laws we know very well that still apply today. And, and that's, of course, not an indicator that he's good with anything other than loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. All right, that kind of concludes this lesson. Uh, I know it was kind of all over the table, but, but Leviticus is actually kind of all over the table with the uh, different various laws. And as I mentioned, there's really no single story there. Uh, there's just a, a lot of facts about how we should be living our lives today, uh, how lives were 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 lived by the Hebrews uh, thousands of years ago. And as you read some of these laws, uh, as the, the one on food and, and nutrition and how our digestive system work, it works, it's just it's so evident to me that God had a plan uh, when he put these words on Moses' heart uh, to, to put down in writing uh, for us today. All right, were these words not in the Bible? I mean, I, I don't know. Would uh, doctors have figured out the digestive system as quickly as they did when they started getting more educated on these things? Uh, it was already in the Bible 2,000 years ago or more. Uh, so it's just incredible to me and, and reminds me of how important it is to read God's Word, uh, delve into it, uh, do research online to understand what some of the things are you saying. And... Uh, just have a good time with it. Have a really good time with it. All right. Uh, next up, as I mentioned earlier, is the book of Numbers. We're still trying to figure out a couple of those stories and, and whether or not we should just move on to, to the next book. Uh, but we do hope uh, you enjoyed this vehicle uh, video. Uh, if you did, please give us a, a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. And uh, as always, we thank you for being with us. Uh, and look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.